excited to have Meg Cooch and Cindy Swanson here from the Arc of Illinois. We love to kick off our education outreach with a topic that we hope will appeal to everyone and then we'll get you excited about what's coming up and how you can advocate for yourself and your child going forward. Um, Meg Cooch serves as the executive director of the Arc of Illinois, building on 20 years of nonprofit policy, advocacy, and organizing experience working with people with disabilities of all ages, families, and community organizations. Previously, Meg served as the first executive director of the Illinois State Alliance of YMCAs. And prior to moving to Chicago, she worked on federal level disability policy in Washington, D.C., working with Lutheran Services and America Disability Network and the Alliance for Retired Americans. Meg has also worked at the local level in San Francisco for Planning for Elders, a grassroots advocacy organization, where she worked in many capacities, including as executive director. Meg has a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She lives in Chicago with her husband and two young children. Cindy Swanson advocates for people with disabilities locally, statewide, and nationally, and as the information and referral specialist for the Arc of Illinois' Illinois Lifespan Program for nearly 15 years, she helps families, professionals, and self-advocates find the resources they need for short and long-term planning empowering people to self-determine their lives with person-centered planning. Cindy and her husband have three grown sons, including Adam, a 31-year-old man with Down syndrome. Adam has an active life in the community, working and recreating with a multiple groups of friends, and he has taught Cindy everything she needs to know about living with a disability. Cindy has a Bachelor of Science degree from Northern Illinois University and was a broadcast journalist until the mid-90s when she lost her vision. In 2001, she earned a master's in social work and is a licensed school social worker. She's on the board of the DuPage Family Disability Network and the National Catholic Partnership for Disabilities. We're thrilled to have her with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Please help me welcome Meg Cooch and Cindy Swan. Thank you very much. So can you hear me if I just talk like this as opposed to? OK. Well, first, I actually want to give um, a little, because I love um, post-its, a little thing to the first person that arrived first year, Wendy, or was the first person to arrive. So thank you for being early and excited. Um, we're thrilled to be here today. Um, my name's Meg Cooch, and um, Cindy will be up soon. Um, today, we thought we'd talk a little bit about Illinois by the numbers, not to start out with the depressing piece, but at least to kind of set the stage as you think about um, transition and what adult services looks like. We we're going to talk a little bit about the alphabet soup of adult services. Um, a person, and then Cindy's going to do a, 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 a piece around person-centered planning, both what the state says and what we really need to think as family members and, um, and as people with disabilities to think about um, our, what we really want to see as our vision and our dream. And then we'll talk a little bit about the ARC programs. We thought we would do that at the end so you could learn kind of why we created some of those programs to help support people and families as we go forward. Um, and then, you know, we'll always have a pitch to get involved. So obviously the first step is to come today. Um, that being said, so I know there were a couple people that were new and never been here before. Um, I will say I see some faces that I, I've known for a little while, and so I'll, I can run, depending on uh, people's familiarity with adult services, this is a pretty 60,000 foot view and first step. So if people want to interrupt and ask or talk about kind of in de depth, more depth, feel free to jump in as we kind of go forward. I don't want this to be boring for people. So first, um, Illinois is second only to Texas in the number of people it houses in um, state institutions, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in state institutions. We're 50th in terms of the, um, the highest percentage of people who live with seven or more um, other folks. Um, and we are 47th out of 50 in funding for um, community living, services that provide support to people um, in homes and communities. And we spend about 55% of the national average. So the national average, we spent half basically of the national average in terms of community services. So much so that there's a, there, was, there were some folks that sued about this issue and there's a consent decree um, that the state is under in, in order to um, help to ensure that people can move off waiting lists and can get the services they need in the community. I'll talk a little more about that. So it's not exactly a rosy picture. You know, we aren't Oregon, we aren't some of the other states that are really out in front, Minnesota, providing a lot of services. Doesn't mean people can't get services, it means we have to advocate that much harder to get what we need and continue to advocate collectively. 
just to, to give you a sense, and we'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of services, but in terms of a picture of where people are living um, and getting receiving services, about 20,000 people receive home and community-based services in Illinois. Um, about 1,600 people are in um, state institutions, state-operated developmental centers. About 4,700 people are in private intermediate care facilities for developmentally disabled, ICFDDs. And then about 22,000 people attend day services, whatever that looks like. That could be a shelter workshop, a day training program, um, a, you know, community integrated day, but 22,000. And there are 19,000 people waiting for services. Before you could totally like, <gasps> it's actually so 7,500 people are actively waiting for services. The rest of the folks are in planning, um, that sort of thing. So how many people here are on the puns waiting list? Oh, I like that. Oh, I don't even know if I have that much stuff to give you guys. Um, all right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, who, who's the first person over here that's on it? Take something and pass. All right, so for folks that are not on the PUDS waiting list, that is one of the first things to think about. Um, I just, but before we jump into that, let me, I found this slide, I'm sure it was created a number of years ago, but it's pretty consistent still. Um, this is things people before their kid turns 18 or when they turn 18, what they should think about. Um, I, I wanted to say, so applying for SSI and applying for Medicaid, two, two big things that are really important. We're not gonna talk about either of those today, but there is a, um, on, on, in your little packet of information, there is November 8th, an event that's all about getting benefits and keeping them, um, and it's in ALSIP, so it's a little bit, it's the southwest suburbs, so a little bit, it's not in Palatine, sorry. But um, it is a full day. Sherry Schneider, who some of you might know, um, is sort of leading it off, and it's a fundraiser for our assistive technology fund. Um, and so it's in your packet, and I'd really recommend, if you want to learn more about SSI, Medicaid, guardianship, all of those things in detail, November 8th, if you can. The other thing you know, to think about is you know, think about guardianship or supported decision making, how you want to make sure that, that um, individuals with disabilities can um, determine and direct their lives, need to think about um, uh, a, a school power of attorney, um, an Illinois identification card, paratransit, transportation, obviously a huge issue, um, registering for selective service if that's relevant, and registering to vote, really, really critical. I should have put that probably first, um, as, as people turn 18. And then again, November 8th, um, how to get benefits and keep them. So the alphabet soup of direct service, or uh, of adult services. So let's just start off for a second about who, um, who can tell me for Medicaid long-term services? So if you need Medicaid for, um, for, to receive some sort of services and supports going forward, um, which is, if you raise your hand, which is the entitlement? Is an institution an entitlement or is home and community-based services the entitlement? Anyone? Go ahead. So I'm gonna give you a, uh, you choose. So, Entitlement means if you qualify for it, oh, there you go. Um, entitlement means if you qualify for it, you get access to it immediately. And for, for Medicaid, the institutional structure, institutions, ICFDDs, that is the entitlement. We are actually not, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not entitled to receive services if, they, if they're qualified for them. What this means is, this happened, it's a weird quirk, because it happened because Medicaid was created in 1965. And in 1965, seniors and people with disabilities, of all kinds of disabilities, lived a lot at home, but they also lived a lot in institutions. That was, and that was the place that people were struggling to pay for. So when Medicaid passed, they said, oh, well, we want to make sure people, as they age or experience disability, that they have a place to go and that Medicaid covers it. We're being so generous and progressive. And so they covered in the state plan, in a baseline, if you get Medicaid and you qualify, you can have access to a nursing home or a state-operated developmental center or an ICFDD. But then as time went on, lots of families said, well, I, my loved one can stay at home, they can have a job, they can you know, do all sorts of things in lives. I, I don't want them to go away to an institution. And so uh, over time, states have been able to develop these things called home and community-based service waivers. A waiver means that they can create a great program, they can put a scope on it, they can decide what services are in it, and then they can decide how many people they'll pay for, which means that we have a thing called a waiting list in our state, because the Illinois has chosen not to fully pay for everyone that qualifies for services. 
The reason this is important is this is this is federal legislation. Uh, uh, this is federal legislation that passed and created Medicaid, and as a result, um, impacts us pretty much every day. And that's something that federally people are advocating to try to make changes to, to make sure that home and community-based services could be that entitlement, could do so that if you qualify, you get to have you get to stay at home and receive services at home or um, in a group home or in your friend's home wherever at the same rate and the same way you can get access to an institution. But there's more advocacy that needs to be done for it. That explains, the reason I also say that is that explains what I asked about the PUNS waiting list because we have a waiting list for home and community-based services here. Um, the PUNS waiting list is basically the list of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who need services. Um, it, it is the first step to getting services, so in order to get adult services in the state, you need to be on the PUNS waiting list, um, or the PUNS list. There are two active categories. They re just restructured it. So you basically have people that are actively seeking services and waiting, and then people that are in planning. So a lot of the folks in this room who have kids under 22 that are still in school, you all would be in the planning. You can still get your kids on the list if you're not already on the list, but you'd be in the planning stage. Um, there is, for folks that are adults, there is a way to go around it. Unfortunately, it's really awful, which is you have to be in crisis. And the definition of crisis is very much homeless. The parent you live with passes away. A legitimate crisis needs 24-hour immediate help. But you, you can, if that happens, God forbid, that you, you can get services. Otherwise, you go through, basically, and you contact your, um, your independent service coordination agency. It's a mouthful. ISC. Independent Service Coordination Agency. Um, and what you do is you tell them we want to get on the puns list, and they basically do a pre-admission screening who asks you questions, um, and you basically check in with them each year until you get or need services and get called up. To get your ISC, you can call the Lifespan Program. You can Google Independent Service Coordination Agency. Um, there's, hold on, uh, there are 17 of them right now in the state. Um, you have one in your area, you have that one, you have the right to ask for a different one. If you'd prefer or hear about you really love one group, you can change ISCs. Um, if everyone here is in Palatine, you're most probably, well, does anyone know which ISC or th this area? Oh, I like that. CAU, very good. So Chicago is split, uh, because you know it would be too convenient if it was just one. So it's sw split between CAU and a group called CSO. The dividing line is Lake Street, I believe. But, but basically what you can do is you can call one, you can call um, our, our office, the Lifespan Program, and they will tell you, you, you can, they'll put your name in. Go ahead. So, I don't know if this is too heavy for this conversation, but there's changes coming. I was about to so so I was about to say so they just they just put out a request for proposals. No, so okay, so it's it's legit. So they just put out a new. They're they're basically consolidating all of these. There's 17 of them. 17 is kind of a lot, right? So at least some people believe, including the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So they've decided that they're going to put out a notice to, for pe organizations to reapply to be ISCs and they're gonna move it to 12. So that, that process, people in this room, parents in this room wouldn't be affected by this until um, the next summer. Um, it's gonna be a kind of a run through, a pro they basically apply to be the ISC and people, ISCs can apply to be one area or three areas, it's gonna be an interesting thing. So there is changes coming down, but for right now, you know, CAU is pretty big, you can call CAU. Um, and actually I think I, hey, there we go. So if you have not called CAU, um, it's Community Alternatives United, and that's their address, and you can call that number there or just type in CAU. I'll wait for a second. Um, to qualify for services, and I'll go back to the slide in a second, it looks like there's some folks writing, writing down. You also all have the slides in there, so your, it should, that slide should be in your slide. I realize the slide deck. Um, so to qualify for services, an individual must have an IQ of 70 or below before the age of 18, or have, and this is always a mouth call, related condition or significant life skills de de defect, deficiencies, deficits, thank you, I can't read that for some reason, um, in three or more of the following areas, self-care, language, learning, mobility, self-direction, uh, capacity for independent living. The important thing here is the 18, and just making sure that through your IEPs, through um, any um, special ed, um, your schools that you have, um, a signed document, and it's gotta be signed because I've heard of families who get their document that says, hey, they are officially have this diagnosis and that sort of thing, um, and then it's not signed, it's only a draft, and that doesn't count. You need to have it official before the age of 18, um, ideally. So, 
Okay, so let's say you get the golden ticket. You're pulled off the puns waiting list. First thing it happens is person-centered planning. You get called by your um, independent service coordination agency. Um, there's also, the ARC has a group called the Ligus Family Advocates. You can just think of family advocates. They'll also reach out. They are families, so they've been through this process before, um, and they can help to support you in your advocacy for what you want for your child or um, an individual for what they want for themselves. But the ISC will call and do a thing called person-centered planning. Um, Sydney's going to talk way more about person-centered planning in a second, so I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's just to say that they do. There's a discovery process to try to figure out what you want and need. Um, and I will say you need to advocate for what, um, what your loved one, what your family member wants um, to get in the plan. Because if it's not in plan, even if it's not going to get, it's, you know, individualized services every day to be able to go do five things a day and so on and so forth, things that would be really hard in the current system. If it's in the plan, they have to every year justify why they can't do it. So if it's not in the plan, they don't have to tell you why they can't do it. So we're going to talk briefly about living options, um, uh, day, very briefly about day and employment options and, and support services. And hearing from Linda about kind of your plans for the year, that I think you'll have a lot of options to think about thinking outside the box. This is really the top line of kind of what is currently being provided. Um, and so I will caveat, there are amazing, innovative things happening. Um, and parents are making them happen. Family members and individuals are making it happen um, and, and kind of working outside the system in order to do it. So I'm going to show you kind of what the boxes are. But please know that there's an entire different one, which is an advocacy box to get what you want for your kid as well, if it's not this. So the two kinds are Community Integrated Living Arrangements, CILA, um, and the second is Home-Based Services. So SILA services are basically bundled. <clears throat> I think when I came, <clears throat> I've been at my job for about a year and a half. I didn't mention that. So not that long in the scheme of the world. And for the longest time, I was like, SILA, group homes. SILA, group homes. No, SILA is not just group homes. SILA, there's four types of SILA options. And we're advocating to try to get them to be more flexible in those types of options, which we'll talk about in a second. And the second is home-based services, which tends to be services in um, a family home. Um, but SILA services are, are basically very much tied to a service provider. It's a bundled package of services. So you can get um, uh, res some residential services and some um, and, and day services, but it's bundled and it's connected with the service provider generally. A home ser home based services is really led by the individual and the family. They can create a menu of services. They can provide the the family members can provide support if they want um, that funding. Um, the big difference is SILA rates can depend, um, can be flexible and are more generous um, because you you sometimes provide more service hours. Um, home based rates, no matter what the support need is, you get three times the SSI rate, which is uh, basically $27,000 a year. So you basically, you have a lot of flexibility, but you have a budget and you can't go above that budget. So residential services, so the SILA options, we have what we think of as 24 hour homes, right? So um, SILA services doesn't technically pay for housing, SSI would pay for housing, but it's basically what we think of as traditional group homes. Other people have been able to have individual SILAs with a lot of advocacy, but, um, but they're basically 24 hour um, uh, staffed situations. There's host family homes, which is also 24 hour situations, and that's a great thing here, actually, I realized. So, so SILA service is a group home they can share with other people. A lot of times in this state, it's four to eight people. There's a, um, at the state level, there's a committee that's been created to look at rates, so how we pay for those services. And the good thing about it is they're trying to look at it to say, right now, when, when rates were created way back when, the eight bed SILA model, the idea of eight people living together was really progressive. It was, way, it was way smaller than 16 beds or big institutions, right? But now, a lot of people, I haven't lived with eight people since I was uh, a full-time volunteer right after college, right? Most people choose not to do that. And so they're looking, they're finally starting to look at, hopefully, um, rejiggering re the rate structure so that it actually incents for people to live with smaller groups of people um, so that it gives providers enough money to be able to pay for having a two or a four person home rather than um, incenting people to have eight people. But it tends to be um, multiple people in a home. Host homes are where, um, where families, if a family that is not related to the individual takes in the individual and they live, the person lives with another family. So there's people there 24 hours a day. Um, a, a, an agency, a, a licensed SILA agency would come in and provide support as well. But, um, and this is actually a growth model. Clearbrook has it. Actually, Little City has host homes. Looking into it, sorry. 
Um, uh, and there's a number of, of groups that it's a, it's a growing, and actually across the country it's really growing because it's a way the, the family um, gets some funding, but then there's also services that are from a coordinated agency, um, and, uh, and it's a little, it's more of a family-based feel to it than, um, than maybe a larger home. And as I said, they're 24 hour and support seven days a week in those two models, those two structures. Family Scylla is, um, to me, I was like, why is everyone not doing it? And it's, it, it's a little bit hard because of the staffing uh, crisis right now. But the Family Scylla idea is that the person stays at home with the family, but you have a service provider come in to provide services um, in your home for that person. So it's not necessarily um, 24 hour around the clock paid staff, but it allows a person to stay in the home. And then if for some reason, a parent ages and the person needs to maybe move into a, a different home structure, a group home, you can just easily move in. You can move through that. Um, when you're in home-based, it's, it's harder to get into Scylla. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then intermittent Scylla. You know, these things, the, the names are always screwy. So intermittent Scylla is where an individual can live at home, they can live with family. Um, when we talk about a lot of these creative housing ideas, intermittent Scylla might be a really good option because it basically would allow if you can find um, a home, either supportive, supported housing or affordable housing, you could bring in intermittent Scylla. And that is basically 15 hours a week to, they can negotiate, they're supposed to be able to negotiate up to 23 hours you know, a day or whatever of services. You can, it's a range, um, it allows for a range of hours. Um, they're still working and we're doing a lot of advocacy around making this uh, really re be reflect people's support needs. Um, for a while, it was just 15 hours. You got 15 hours no matter what. And now um, they're trying to make it more flexible to be able to have more hours for people. But it's a great option if you don't need 24-hour necessarily um, eyes on. But um, it can it can allow people to do things like manage uh, bills and things like that, as well as bring in DS direct support professionals as needed. And then on the home base, so let me pause for a second. Any questions or any kind of further, for the folks that really know this stuff, any further comments about Scylla? When you said 15 hours a week per day, was it? Well, so, no, per week. It was, it was the, so the issue was they were, um, the division was reading it very narrowly, the, the, um, the rules and what they found, and they've had, they have a directive on it that says that it's not just 15 hours a week, that it can go up. I mean, the idea is it's intermittent, so it's, it's not 24 hour services. So it's not going to be 24 hours a day, but that actually if a person is a high, it has a, a lot of need for services and supports, they should be able to get more than 15 hours a week. So there's, um, there's a group that's been trying to work on uh, reinforcing that with the people that approve these things. Uh, we're still in process. Go ahead. Yeah, you. looking at having like, overnight support, or would that so a lot of people, a lot of people that do intermittent Scylla or have intermittent Scylla services would um, maybe have a job so they don't have someone, you know, they go to their job, they come home, maybe they do some kind of flexible day stuff, but um, it's kind of a, a, a range of things. Um, so a person comes in, a lot of times like a Center for Independent Futures, I don't know if folks are familiar, I'm sure in this area they are. Um, well, you might have someone that comes in and checks on you every night. Um, so there's, there's, there's management when there's, there's need for like paying bills and, and queuing and all of those things, but it's just not 24 hour eyes on. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people will use it, but then also use assistive technology potentially to be able to connect with people and that sort of thing. Um, but it's people with a relative amount of independence or that people are really, families are comfortable with having that, that level. So home-based services, um, and this is, so for people that have been pulled off the puns list, this is like two-thirds of people are now choosing this, and I think one of the main reasons is because of the flexibility. Um, so it's, it's not as much money as what you um, potentially get through Scylla services, but um, basically you work with your ISC, and then you can work with what's a self called a self-directed assistant, SDA, which is basically a... I can't say case manager, but basically what you think of as a traditional support person for you to be able to navigate and manage the system. And you decide, you have a menu of services, you decide what, um, or the individual decides what they want. So um, maybe they, they need uh, some personal support in the morning to get ready to go out to do things. Maybe they want to have day services at their home, or maybe they want to go to a couple different kinds of day services. You use the $27,000 to pay for that. And so um, some families, um, so it allows for a lot of flexibility. It allows for, frankly, caregiving to be paid for sometimes um, if, you're, uh, if a family member is the caregiver um, uh, for people um, and, and you create your own budget. 
Um, you can choose to stay with a family, but you, there are lots of people that get home-based and live in supportive housing and other kinds of housing models. So it is something that can be, it's portable, it can go, it doesn't have to be with, the own, with parents or with family. Uh, yeah, so it's three times the SSI rate is the easiest way because SSI sometimes changes. But, but yeah, it's basically you get that amount of money and you create a budget. So home-based is, is separate. So this is, SILA is, is one model, and so intermittent SILA, it's sort of a, they, you figure out a rate is what you get with intermittent SILA. You don't get like a menu of services. You work with a service provider to, to provide the services you need. Home-based is the second bucket, if you think. So there's SILA bucket that has four different things in it, and then there's the home-based bucket. Um, and you have to select, when you get pulled off puns, you have to select one or the other. Um, and the, the, the hiccup, which I find really frustrating and it's gonna be, we need to fix, is that if you choose home-based, you can't just say, oh, you know, they need more support. Um, uh, an individual might say, hey, I wanna live independent from my parents and I wanna live in a group home. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna go to Scylla now. You actually have to go back on the puns list. So it is an important decision to make. That's why actually I really feel like people Family, family Scylla could be a challenge sometimes, and it might not work for everyone, but people should look at it, because it then once you're in the Scylla bucket, you can move around the Scylla bucket um, if things change. But if you're in the home-based bucket, you have to go back. Go ahead. What happens if you already had the home-based and you had it for quite some time? You still can't you have to go in the bucket again? You have to go back in the bucket, unless you're in crisis. Yeah. Okay, but it's actually about the same amount of money, 27000 because you get 23 whatever when they become an adult. It's, it's lower when they're still in school. So it's, it's one of those, I think it's a matter of um, how many hours of service and where you want to be provided. So the, the positive, I think home-based is really attractive to people because there's really, uh, it, it's like we do with our own world, right? You figure out your budget, you figure out what you need, you figure out your budget, and then you go do it, as opposed to Scylla, which is much more, kind of feels more confined sometimes. I think the big thing with Scylla is if people's needs increase or if parents age, or if circumstances change, you can kind of grow and flex within that system. It's harder to do that because you have a, you only have so much money, so you get that kind of money for home base. So as people think about future planning. Can I give an example? We have the family solo yep. for our son Will, and so I know our CAU rep said that we get to keep the money because we're providing care. So it goes to Will. And the, the, no one takes the money. So I was going to say, so I, that was the one so, thing I was going to say, is that's for group homes. That is not for, so 24-hour residential homes. When you talk about intermittent SILA and family SILA, exactly that, that it doesn't. Because we're providing yes. a, a, a great amount of this care. So uh, the family SILA for us works wonderfully because of Will's health. But um, for the employment earnings that he does have, they don't um, garnish those. I just have to report them to Social Security. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's just the 24-hour group, the group home because they use, basically, providers use that to be able to pay for the housing portion because our, our waiver dollars are technically not supposed to go for housing. So presumably, you would, he would keep that and be paying for his house instead. Does that make sense? OK, so quickly, and then I'm like over time on this. So Linda, and then um, what's your name? I'm sorry. Jen. Jen, thank you. Actually, I know, sorry. Um, so Linda, Jen, and then there was someone over here. OK, there we go. Just quickly for home-based, if you do home-based instead of Scylla. Mm -hmm. In the past, there seemed to be resistance to allowing people to use home-based money to create a residential situation. Is that changing? Because it sounds like it is. But I think a lot of people aren't finding Scylla to be a good fit for a variety of reasons. Keep home base to create their own model, whether they work with a provider or do not, whatever. Um, is that the case? So it, it, yes, kind of, in that um, they're still in the, in the home based regs. You're not allowed to have three people or more that receive home base in the same place. They're concerned that there's going to be some sort of uh, institutional structure created. So you could have two people with home base <laughs> living together, but I believe it's three is the cutoff, is where you can't have more than three people receiving home base services in the same home. Unrelated. Right? Unrelated, yes, sorry. So yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Okay. So my question was, it seems to me like a family home, that is kind of the home base of what we so the one thing is for, for family Scylla is you cannot provide, um, you, I believe this is what it is, and correct me for, um, I'm sorry, what's your name back there? 
What's your name? Barb. Barb, sorry. Barb, so Barb corrects me. Um, uh, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, my understanding is that, that in Scylla, it's really, um, there's, there's a provider connected to the world. In home base, you know, and, and a family member can provide those services, but in Scylla for like direct support services, uh, I, my understanding was that a home, that the um, family cannot, if not be a related person to the person to provide um, fund, um, provide direct support services. Okay, thanks. Thanks for confirming. Um, and actually, there's a person waiting over here. Sorry. Yeah, and so that was similar to my question. Like I said you wasn't clear to me what was the difference between that family home Scylla and home base service. The other thing is that the family home base Scylla, I mean, it's technically, well, yeah. The big thing is that you basically have a relationship with a provider. The provider provides all the support services. The family is, it's, it, the location is really, is, is, the, is in the commonality. But in the home base side, um, it's really, there's a lot more flexibility with the money. Um, so a provider could be the, the mom or the dad or whomever could be the direct support provider. They don't, you don't have to have a relationship with a service provider and home base if you don't want to. But in, in this family silly, you do. Okay, and then, Barb, did you want to follow up? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, well, jumping off of that, our, our other son, John, was one of Will's um, PSWs. Oh. Um, and that was allowed because he was a sibling. Neither my husband nor myself okay. could be a personal support worker for our son. So, so this is really this, confusing. Yeah. So thank you for the clarification and correction. I'm just telling you how we do it. Yeah, I no, 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 no. I mean, I, so, so I think this all goes back to the key takeaway because I, I need to turn over for person center planning to make sure you guys get that. Um, uh, that conversation is, is that you know, your ISC is there to be that um, independent uh, case management support. They're supposed to help you think through not just what you want, although we would argue you need to think about that in advance to be advocates and ready to go, but they also can help you navigate. Um, we, we do the ARC, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, have a lot of events that talk about this stuff in, um, in the weeds, as well as we have some information and resources. We have an information and resource line, um, and we have family support um, uh, workers who can work and, and talk to you about the individual services and maybe how you can coach you on how to navigate that if you need it. So there are people that can support you in figuring out. A lot of it is just figuring out what you need and demanding it and then make, getting to make it work. I've found in my year and a half of doing this that the squeaky wheel, um, if you're friendly squeaky wheel, it can get the grease in a way that, you know, as, as in many other worlds. So um, I just want to talk briefly about, I know you're going to have a whole thing, you had a whole thing last year on unemployment and you're going to have um, a bunch of the visits, so I won't talk too much. Um, and this is actually missing a box over here, so pretend there's another box over here. So I just want to make sure, you know, in the package of services, especially on the Scylla side uh, and in home base, you're, they're supposed to also be included employment and day services. So the things, you know, that are, can be included in this, obviously, is working the community employment, supported employment, which we could do a whole day on, right? Um, sheltered workshop, day, day training, adult daycare, in-home day services, especially on the home base side. And then what I missed over here, which I can't believe I missed it, or this is someone else's slide, I'm not sure which, but is, um, <laughs> is I'm going to blame it on someone else. Flexible community day. So the idea that, you know, I, you referenced Ray Graham, there are, there are a number of different little cities doing this. A number of different providers are trying to figure out ways uh, within the current funding, which is ridiculously low for what we should be able to do, and we're advocating to, and would love you all's support to advocate to raise it, is to basically allow much more self-directed or small group directed day services. As we push and, and cut kids, especially coming out of transition now, want employment, most probably it will be a little bit of employment and a little bit of day and a little bit of fun with friends and like, like the rest of us live, right? So, so um, we, they are really pushing the envelope and I'm, I'm thrilled that, that you guys are taking folks out to check it out because I think really thinking outside the box to figure out what, um, what uh, service providers are doing to try to make it smaller experiences it's directed by the individuals and, um, and small groups of individuals classically day services has been large scale, you go to the day program, you know, and that's what it is. And it is changing very slowly. Um, on home-based, you are able to do a little bit more of, you know, paying for the arts program you really like and the this you really like if you want to manage that. That's the one thing with home-based Scylla services. It's much harder to do that. It's much more, you know, you work with a service provider and there are service providers that are really trying to kind of push the envelope on what that day program can look like. Um, but the state is slow in responding to that. 
So I just wanted to, um, and then lastly, you, do, you can receive other support services, things like nursing, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, some adaptive equipment and assistive technology. We're doing some advocacy work to try to expand the assistive technology being funded, but I just want to mention that as well. Um, lastly is, you know, I, I mentioned the Ligas Consent Decree. This is basically a bunch of folks, including Stanley Ligas, who is right here, um, uh, sued back in 2005 and said, I want to live, they were living with eight, eight people, and he's like, I want, in an ICF, he's like, I want to come out, I want to live in the community, um, make this happen. And what they found is they basically, the, the, the court said yes, that the state is not doing enough to make sure people move off the waiting list that are waiting for services and people that want to come out of institutions can move into the community. So um, the, the way this impacts the long and short of it is they're basically the state is out of compliance on the consent decree. They haven't put enough money in. So that's where this rates group is at the state level is happening. They're basically looking at what do they need to increase rates to, how do they need to change it so that there's actually real community home and community-based services offered to people. People have the choice of what they want. As well as um, over the last seven years or so, we've been, they basically had a forced um, movement of about 900 people off the waiting list each year. So um, between those two things, those are the two things that are kind of happening right now. It's important because during the budget crisis the last couple of years, providers got paid because of this consent decree. They forced them to get paid and, um, and it's something to watch as a way to try to continue to advocate and push the state to provide the services that we all really want. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy to do uh, to talk about person-centered, person-centered life and person-centered planning. So, um, I am so thrilled to have Meg as our executive director. Um, I worked with Tony Pulaski, who is awesome, and then Beth has come along. And thank you so much, Beth, for your great leadership. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to families. And I, I kind of feel like the wise and elder of the tribe because I am. Um, and it's good to see so many parents um, trying to get information. If I could, my dream would be to be when the baby is born with a disability or when the diagnosis comes because it's never too late, but it's never too early to do this. Never too late, never too early. So as my bio told you, we have a 31-year-old son with Down syndrome, and um, I, I was like Butterfly McQueen. I knew nothing about people with disabilities, nothing, nothing. But what I did know was that we were gonna have a family that had big dreams, that worked hard for those dreams, and really learned a lot. My husband and I were both accessors of information. So I was accessing information. And as my bio said, I was a news reporter, so I'm also very cynical about the information I get. So we'd look at things and go, well, does this really work? So my son was born, they gave him to me, and they said, well, you know, he'll never read. And I laughed. I was like, come on, of course he's going to read. What are you talking about? And in, in first grade, he went around the whole school and read a book to all the teachers and stuff. So it's having that appreciation for professionals, but also knowing what your own family culture is going to be about. So um, my son was about six years old and I went to Canada and I took training from the great Center for Inclusion, Marsha Forrest and Jack Pierpoint. Are you all familiar with those people? Look them up, they were wonderful. They were the ones that took the planning process from the business world. So what we're gonna talk about has been used to sell hamburgers and computers and the Center for Inclusion said, gee, we're selling hamburgers and computers in a planful way, in a very planful way. Let's see how this works in human services, right? In human services. So you have the baby or you get the diagnosis and somebody tells you, well, this is what's going to happen and this is what's not going to happen. And then you go to school and they tell you some more of what your child may or may not do. And, and it's all an individual education plan, right? It's, it's still pretty prescribed, though. And does it fit with your family? So um, again, we had a very strong family kind of mission. We actually did what Stephen Covey did and wrote a mission statement for our family. And, and my husband went along with all that because he's a great guy. And um, then I went for this training on, um, on, on the person-centered tool, person-centered planning. Now, for those of you who do have services from home-based support or whatever, 
you've probably come across what the state is now calling discovery. Now I can't see, but raise your hand and somebody tell me, are you all familiar with discovery, what the state's calling discovery? Five, five. five okay. So discovery is the, is the format, the formula that the state has come up with for what they're calling dis um, person-centered planning. And, and that's good. That's good that the state has recognized that person-centered planning is a good idea. But it's, it's kind of like um, Duncan Hines buying a, um, a cake mix or going to the bakery and buying a cake. It's what they've put together. And so if you're the person that likes to mix and pull the recipe together, then I'm going to talk about a person-centered planning tool. It was called MAPS, Making Action Plans. And, um, and I'm going to have you all kind of participate in it. Now, most of you are parents. Some of you are, are in the professional world. Those of you who are in the professional world, try to think of one student, I guess, as we're going to go through this exercise. So there's a little bit of the history of the, um, of the map. That it, is a, it is a tool used in the business world. So where we're gonna, going to start out is um, talking about your, your individual. And if you, I know, um, I know Meg put out pens for everybody. So if there's paper at your table or if you want to flip over the PowerPoint and kind of make notes with this, what I'd like you to do, and, I, and I've got, um, I think, I, I don't know how much time I have, but we're going to go through the whole map process. We're going to talk about what your dream is for your child. And we're going to pretend that nobody told you anything about your child, not their genetic makeup, not their non-neurotypical behaviors. What is your dream for your child? And, 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 I, and I want you to think about that um, because sometimes our dream is that um, they're going to be millionaires or they're going to have tons of friends or, or, or whatever it's going to be. And I'm, I'm going to feed a little bit of this to you. And this is probably not the best thing for a facilitator to do, but I'm very serious about this. One of our nation's biggest concerns right now, um, can anybody identify what one of the biggest concerns in our nation is right now? Addiction to screen. What's that? Addiction to screen. Addiction to screen. OK. Let's go, let's go deeper than that. Somebody said, health care. Thank you. <laughs> Give the lady a clip. <laughs> but addiction to screen and health care are kind of connected, right? So my dream for me, my family, for every one of you is need good health care. So now let's start looking at the rest of this. Um, and, and so I'm going to ask each one of you to put down after health care, <laughs> as I fed that to you, um, what would be two more dreams for your person that you're identifying? Let's, let's think about that. And I really do want you to write this down. The MAP process is usually a three-hour process. I'm, I'm going through this real quickly. Um, but I want you to add flavor of this. And tonight when you go home to your family and either have chocolate or wine, um, because this is an exhausting thing to get all this information, I want you to think about doing a MAP. When you do a discovery, you're doing it with yourself and your facilitator. When you do a MAP, you do it with a, with a crowd of loving people. OK, I've talked through those two minutes. Anybody um, willing to raise their hand or shout out what would be one of your dreams other than good health care? Shout, shout out. To have a, um, be able to support herself. Be able to support herself. OK, great. Support employment. Absolutely. These are good. Live independently. Yes, yes. Very good. Socially acceptable. Socially wonderful. To, have, um, to be loved. To have good social interactions with other people. OK. To be able to regulate herself. OK. Emotions. OK. Now, we're going to flip the page. And this is a part that a lot of us don't like because it's called the nightmare. The nightmare is something that um, we, if we have a child with a disability, sometimes it creeps in. Like, oh my god, I'm getting old. Oh my gosh, this is happening. Oh, oh my. And then we have some more chocolate or wine, and then we go on with the day. But it is a true thing. And the true thing is, if we don't touch that nightmare, we may end up living the nightmare. And so I think that's, it's kind of like, we don't want to be ostriches, you know? And, um, and so I think I'd like us to each to identify two things on the nightmare list, two things on the nightmare list. 
and one of them cannot be not having good health coverage. So <laughs> we're going to identify that. And then we're going we're to work backwards to all this stuff. But I would say um, for my own son, yes, absolutely, that he's not loved, um, that he's not loved, because uh, he's a lovely man. <laughs> um, I, I think people talk about the really bad things because we do know the high risk of abuse, exploitation, and neglect. So those are things that, that come about in this conversation. So um, talking through this now, anybody want to share something that would be considered a, a nightmare in their Home, Homeless and living on the street. Homeless and living on the street. I want to tell you something. Very frightening kind of thing. Talking to um, Deb Forna, uh, Missy Kitchline and I do the lifespan. We take calls from people. We said something about this person might be homeless. This person doesn't speak English. We, we were having a tr trouble. And somebody from the bureaucracy said, well, you know, after all, some people are homeless. Like, you can't say that and be in my world. Get out of my world. So yeah, that's a big fear. OK, anybody else? Pardon me? Wouldn't it be horrible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone in, someone in the front, say it. Recluse. Recluse, OK. Prison. Prison, that's very important because you know there is no different DOJ, Department of Justice, for our people and for people who don't have disabilities. And that's something the ARC and other advocates are working on, is uh, Department of Justice sees you know, nothing with that. So that's, that's a very big struggle. OK, so we're kind of getting the idea. And truly, what I would like you all to do is this weekend or whatever, and maybe in a couple of weeks, gather people together and, and kind of sit around. Usually, we have posted notes up all over, and it's, it's a very fun kind of thing. But we spend a lot of time on each, each chunk of this and working it through. Now, here's the next part of this. We're going to talk about our gifts and strengths. And um, I'm going to tell you, with some people, you got to think, what, what are my person's gifts? Because you know we've been told a lot over the years, well, your person can't do this, your person can't do that. And DRS says he's absolutely not job ready at all. So that's, that's out of the question. So let's talk about the gifts and strengths. And you know, there's a whole statement that was written about us and them. And I, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but it's, it's this lovely kind of dialogue as we persist. He perseverates, you know. It's looking at those those kinds of behaviors um, that with your your young adult or, or your student may have. But let's come up with two gifts of your individual. Um, I'll tell you one of the gifts of my son is um, at one point we're all hockey players in my family. Well, I'm not, but um, the other people that live with me are hockey players. And um, my son took off immediately with what's called the Tomahawks hockey. Now it's the Chicago Blackhawks special hockey. So we have taught him geography. So we're going to San Francisco. We're going to Washington. You know. So it was it was very fun because he loves. He's a man's man. If there's a ball or a puck getting tossed about, he's there. It's one of his gifts. He loves sports. He loves sports. So talk to through that. What um, somebody volunteer a gift of their their loved one? Let's call it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. I can't see you raising your hand. Good in art. Say that. Good in art. Good in art. Absolutely. There's a lot of wonderful places where we can do that. Anybody else? Loves to sing. Loves to sing. Is is your person in like a church or any kind of choir or anything like that? Good for him. Good for him. Loves to sing. Loves art. I'm going to tell you a secret. This, um, this bracelet, very simple bracelet, it was um, designed and put together by a young woman who has Down syndrome in um, Naperville. And she's a glam girl. She's a glam girl. She's got Down syndrome. She was in softball. And she went like that when the ball came to her. And they said, Kelly, you got to get your ball. And she said, I'm going to break my nails. So. <laughs> So Kelly and her mother started Special Sparkle because she loves art and she loves fashion. So she's created a, a company for her, and, and I always wear Kelly's um, bracelets. So loves art, loves singing. What are some of the, the needs? And, and I don't, I, we used to use weaknesses. I hate weaknesses um, because we all have weaknesses. Let's talk about our needs. What are our needs? Now, I lost my vision 23 years ago. 
My need is a talking, a computer that's got software that talks to me. I am almost not blind when that puppy is running the right way. <laughs> so, um, and, I and I need my service dog. Some of you might have seen um, my, my chocolate lab laying over there. So those are my needs to get around. I need a supportive community. I need people that I work with, people that I work with, honor my gifts, but understand my needs. So that's, that's some of my needs. Um, my son works in the community and he needs paratransit. And we knew a long time ago he was gonna need paratransit, so I started working really hard with the people in DuPage County to create good paratransit. So those are some of his needs. So I've talked through, through that a bit. What, somebody give me some of the needs that they might have identified for their person. Needs to make friends. Needs to make friends, okay. Anyone else? Shopping and paying bills. Shopping and paying bills. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. There's a lot of people based on the deficit. We need a lot of people who understand how to pay bills. Thank you. Anybody else? Needs to feel valuable that they have something to give. Needs to feel valuable. Yes, yes, absolutely. So you kind of see where we're going with this now? Okay, what's my next? Next slide, positive and possible. Okay, what I'm gonna ask you all to do now, we've dreamed big dreams. I did this one time with a, a group of folks and one lady had a little baby boy who was three who had um, autism and she wanted him to become president of the United States. So maybe that might not happen, but that was her dream. So when we, when we go into this dreaming part, now we're gonna look at what's positive and possible. Now the reason that lady, after we discussed this on and on, why do you want him to be president of the United States? And she said, because I want him to be dressed with dignity. I want him to have people respect him. And we went, okay, that's, that's going into the heart of what this was all about. There's a wonderful woman um, in Canada, um, she is, um, she can talk. She's got the movement of one finger. And she's in a wheelchair. And she was two days before committing suicide and a group of her friends pulled her out of that. And her dream was to be a truck driver. A truck driver. She has no use of her legs or her hands, just her finger. And they drilled into it and they said, what is it about truck driving? And she said, I wanna drive all over Canada I want to drive all over Canada and tell people about people with disabilities. So it really wasn't being in the big rig that she wanted, but she wanted to travel around. So when we talk about what our dream is, what our dream is, then let's talk about positive and possible. Now I could have said in, past, in my dream that I wanted my son to play in the NHL, which really wasn't, but I can say that for today's purposes, right? I could say now I want him to play for the Chicago Blackhawks, and he does. He plays for the Chicago Blackhawks special hockey team. So is that positive and possible? Do I say, boy, I'd like my son to play like his brothers and his father and his, his grandfather playing hockey? Well, you know what? He does. He plays in a special needs hockey team. Um, so what, let's come up with two things from your dream and your nightmare the things that you've gathered together from your gifts and needs, and let's come up with two things that would be positive and possible that we could do, that, that your person can do. And, and I'm low tech, so I'd like to see if there's something that we could do within the next couple of weeks to make it positive and possible. Need someone that likes music as much as he does. Okay, meet somebody who loves music as much as he does. And that's possible, right? That's absolutely possible. Great, I like that. Anybody else have something to share with what's positive and possible? Go find some place where he can use his computer skills. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Uh, FaceTime with, uh, with one friend. FaceTime with his one friend. Okay, great. Great, that's positive and that's possible. Anybody else? You have something to say? I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> you can't talk softly. <laughs> you get the idea? 
What, what we'd like to do then is come and, and the, the idea of this model is, and I've done this with all kinds of different groups and families, and I tell them, invite everybody to the table. Invite mom and dad, brothers, sisters, people who have um, a vested interest. Sometimes we'll bring a, a clergy person, a rabbi, a priest, whatever, the pastor, to come in and sit in, in, in. And along this way, one of my other hour-long presentations is building social capital. Building social capital, because we all build social capital. We just did that today, right? We're introducing ourselves to one another. Sometimes we're trading cards, business cards. So it's, it's all along those lines. You invite people to come over and then it should be facilitated by an objective person, but this is, you can still do this on the, at the kitchen table. I've done that when my husband's driving, I've got a captive audience because he can't you know, let me go because he's in the car with me and I, I, we start talking about these things. How are we gonna do this? Some of our deepest conversations. So you get the idea, positive and possible. Okay, what's my next slide? Future search, I love future search because it's so imaginative. And you gave me a great idea with the um, singing and the, um, the art. Future search puts us into, we're here, we're all gathered here again by Linda next year at this time, September 14th or whatever it is at this time and we all come back and we say wow and we use pr um, past tense talking. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, this is the best year in Adam Swanson's life because what we thought was positive and possible was for him to get on a plane without his mother and father and meet his brother and sister-in-law in Vegas. And, and, and he handled it well by himself with us escorting him. So that would be my future search. So what I'd like you to do is put yourselves in the imagination of you've got a year. You've got from now until next September 2019 and believe me, it happens like that, right? Say, what are some of the things, what is, what is the thing that you did to make happen, you did to make happen, any of you did to make happen, so, um, is it a son who's the singer? Yes. So my son, the singer, joined up with a couple of other guys, and they've got a garage band, and they're making a lot of noise in my garage, but I love it. <laughs> um, my son, is it a son who's the artist? Somebody said something about Love's Art back here? Anyway, you, okay, is it a son? Yes. Okay, my son, the artist, joined um, an organization that um, they, they do art together and, and they're exploring their art, something, something like that. And he has shown his art in two different art galleries in the library or whatever, something like that. So try to come up with some of that sort of thing right now and, and we're talking through what are some of the things that you can say a year from now my son, daughter, student did over this year that was part of the future search. That again goes under that positive and possible thing. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about discovery in this state. I want you to understand how much more individual this conversation is than the discovery. And like I said, I'm, I'm thrilled when the state said it's doing discovery. I was thrilled with that because they were finally getting out of uh, a box. But in what we're talking about today doesn't even have a box because your future search is gonna look different than hers, than anybody else's in this room. Whereas the discovery is a template. So when they come by with discovery, you can say, yeah, but um, I wanted my son to be a lifelong le lifelong reader. I went in and I'm blind. How do we do this? So my future search is that my son is in a book club that meets every week. And my son is in a book club. My son, who they said he would never read, is in a book club. Um, and we've researched that. So you have a year now to figure out how this can happen. So anybody want to share? Um, Let's pretend it's September 14, 2019. Somebody share with me what this year looked like for your son or daughter or student. Helper in the kitchen. He'll be a helper in the kitchen. He, he helped in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Very good. How did he get to work? Well, I guess he had to take the bus. Okay. Somehow figure that out. He took That's pace and we figured that out. See what you got a year to do that. Back to the silo that he'll be in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. 
you know, and, and if this is what's important to you, and that's, that's the point of doing this, it is kind of fun, it is kind of creative, but we're thinking positive and possible. You did not say he owns a, franchi a McDonald's French uh, franchise, right? I mean, it's positive and possible. What are the things that you needed to do to make those kinds of things happen? So that's kind of the future search, but again, this is a process that often takes uh, about three hours and a lot of give and take from people because you might say that in your future search and there might be somebody at the table saying, well, really, do you really think he can cook? And you go, yes. I'm going to tell you a little private story. My son just got a new job at North Central College in their one of their little off-site cafeterias. Now, he's been sweeping and cleaning tables and that sort of thing, and he's good at that. I'm. I like a clean house, and he's been the main busser in our family for years. So what his new boss said, you know, I'm going to have him cook. And I thought, oh, gosh, OK, please don't let him get hurt. And she's, she's been around the block. She knows how to be careful with him. So he's taking rounds of dough, pre-made dough, and putting them in like a hopper. And that hopper slides through, and there's somebody on the other end fetching the, the panned out pizza dough, right? He can do that. He can do that. He, my son is cooking. So, <laughs> in, in, you know, for college students, and what a good atmosphere. They love him. They're like, oh, there's a nice little short guy. He makes everybody feel tall because he's so short. <laughs> like I do. I make you all feel really tall, right? So those are the kinds of things you're thinking about. But if you see that as a, as a future search, then you go, that's what I want to do. Now, if somebody said, in their future search, he has, um, he's got employment. So I, I did this with a family one time and they lived in a subdivision. At the end of the street, there was a restaurant. And I said, I noticed there's a restaurant at the end of your court. I think you need to go there for dinner every Sunday night as a family. And they went, why? Can anybody tell me why? Social capital, social capital. I did social capital with a group of people with developmental disabilities and they, they go, is that like making friends? <laughs> I said, yes, that's like making friends. Social capital. And I said, you go there, you go there, you go there, all four of you, because they're nice people, you know. The dad's a salesman. He, Hi, how do you do? How's everything going, you know? For my son, he, my husband, he'd know their children and what sports they're in. So then, you know, they sit down, and I said, and the one time their son didn't make it because he had some kind of an athletic event to go to. And they said, where's Justin? Oh, that's number one, right? They're missing him on Sunday nights. And I said, he'll, he'll get a job there. And, you know, I have to tell you, I, I do these meetings. It's like with IEPs. I say, you do this and this will happen. And then I walk out and, and I'm Catholic and I go, yes, I want to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it did, it did. They, they went to that restaurant every Sunday evening, afternoon for dinner, the whole family, the son, the daughter, the mom, the dad and probably tipped well, and it was just like a little family diner, and the kid did get a job there after a while. And now, now he has elevated himself to working at McDonald's. So, you know, because he's a restaurateur, he works at McDonald's. Now what's important, okay, what's my next slide, because I'm running out of time. That's it, That's it. okay.